hello everybody and welcome to the going beyond self-care during difficult times webinar we have a wonderful opportunity today to learn effective exercises and reflections to help with motivation confidence and overall self-care so for the structure of today's webinar i'm going to introduce our guest speaker dr matthew Gloyak. we will hear his presentation and then we will wait and take questions at the very end so with that, let me tell you about our keynote speaker. Dr. Matt Gloyak is core clinical faculty at Southern New Hampshire University and contributing faculty here at Yorkville and Walden Universities. He earned his doctorate of counselor education and supervision at Walden University. And Dr. Gloyak has over a decade of experience serving diverse clients with a wide range of mental health issues and substance abuse disorders. He has also taught over a dozen different topics to undergraduate, masters, and doctoral students. Dr. Gloyak is an international presenter and is, and is published in nine graduate counseling textbook chapters, dozens of peer reviewed journals, and he recently released his first solo book, A Year of Finding Your Callings, Daily Practices to Uncover Your Passion and purpose. So it is with great pleasure that we welcome Dr. Gloyak to talk with us today about self-care in today's demanding and changing world. Thank you for the cordial introduction, uh, Dr. Wheeler. And to everybody else, we'd like to take an opportunity to thank each and every one of you for being here in this presentation uh, today. And I was just speaking before we started this presentation about how excited I am and just how privileged I feel to be approaching my one year anniversary with Yorkville you, with uh, Yorkville here, it's been a really great experience teaching in this program. Uh, the students are honestly second to none. I appreciate working with the faculty and the administration here as well. And I have to say that, you know, there's a really great thing that's going on here. And I'm privileged to be a part of it, both in teaching as well as being here with this presentation today. Um, so today's presentation is going beyond self-care during difficult times. Um, so essentially what I am planning to cover here is Dr. Willard shared earlier, I had released a book uh, this year, a year of finding your callings. And the book is uh, made up of a bunch of daily prompts that help individuals go from the point of having a dream, establishing a goal and moving forward with a solid plan that can essentially help set you up for an entire lifetime. Now the book is highly involved. There are many different moving paste pieces. Uh, the book was written for a general type of audience. So it's very straightforward. And I see a lot of the feedback back I've been receiving in the different reviews, you know, state just that it's a straightforward type of book. But as you go through and you hear some of the things I'm going to be discussing, especially those of you in the psychology counseling type of program, you're going to notice a bunch of the underlying theories that are incorporated into it. And as I was putting the book together, I was thinking about each and every theory, how they integrate and how we can scaffold a year of being able to follow your calling. So that's essentially what this presentation is going to cover here as we move forward. The truth is that we are amidst very difficult times. These past couple of years have been extremely challenging. Now, the reality is that we can say since the beginning of human civilization, we've been facing different challenges. You know, especially when we take a look here at the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, the world is no stranger to pandemics. And we've seen smallpox, we've seen polio, we've had SARS, and we had Ebola. So many different pandemic crises over the, over the decades here you know, they've impacted all of us in different ways. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a bit different. And then this one was quite expansive and we have faced very much loss during a period of time in which there's been a lot of civil unrest and other types of issues going on, talking about climate change and so on. And when we stack these types of factors on top of one another, they have this compounding type of effect that does impact just about anybody. So individuals with previously diagnosable mental health and addiction type disorders are seeing these grow, while individuals who may not have had any issues with mental health are now starting to feel the pressure of it. You know, some of the more common experiences that we are seeing in the literature, especially in, in more recent research, is that individuals are reporting higher levels of anxiety, higher levels of depression, substance use and addiction, fear, and so on. I won't go through and read every single one of these. However, I can say in my personal experience and also professional experience that these are common things that people have been reporting to me. As a clinician, I've had many clients come in to see me sharing how they're stressed out because they have no idea what the future entails. They're worried about getting sick. 
they're becoming frustrated with mixed messages in the media. Should we get vaccinated? Should we not? Should I wear a mask? Should I not? I feel really restricted with everything going on. When individuals face a loss of control, that's when they really start to feel anxious and all these other negative emotions really start to kick in. You know, and same thing with my students as I'm trying to facilitate a class. I'm a very compassionate educator for those of you perhaps who have attended one of my classes before here, you know, know the way that I run my class. And I'm a very attentive to individual needs as I'm working with you. And I encourage you to reach out to me. And with the reach out that I've received from students, whether Yorkville, Southern New Hampshire, where I'm at here in the United States, you know, many have been sharing you know, having family members who've experienced COVID. They've been sharing having COVID themselves. They've been sharing having other individuals with different terminal illnesses and so on, being unable to visit them in the hospital. And all this time, I've been so focused on everybody else that I wasn't thinking about myself. You know, I was just kind of, okay, you know, I'm a counselor. This is what it is. I'll just take care of everybody else. Things in my life are going well. I'm feeling pretty good about it. However, at the same time, when I actually stopped to, took pa to take pause, you know, more recently here in uh, 2021, I had struggled with some very difficult things. A very close friend of mine um, diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer, triple negative, so not a good prognosis. You know, a cousin did something terrible. My grandmother diagnosed with leukemia, left my private practice. You know, I'm an extroverted person here at home trying to make it work. We were pregnant during the pandemic after coming off a miscarriage in 2019. And, you know, as I'm really sitting here and trying to process this and feeling that I'm very strong as both an experienced clinician and a professor, and I'm tending to everybody else's needs. I'm like, wow, Matt, you know, there's a, a lot going on in your life. You really need to pay attention to these things that are going on, you know, because for so long, I was starting to have this feeling of being lost, feeling trapped, noticing that I was having instability in terms of mood. Now, I'm mostly a very stable person. You know, I've had nicknames, uh, you know, my other university, they call me the big happy Mr. Positivity. One of my key sayings is thank you for being awesome. I'm always this cheerful guy. And when I would go into work, you know, being a virtual type of setting here. You know, people would immediately come to my attention. Hey, Matt, what fun thing do you have to share today? And I'd be goofy and be a clown and everyone around me sees that, you know, oh, things are going well with him. But internally, I was really struggling and had to figure it out. So a big battle for me over the past couple of years has been how do I maximize this experience? And that's what I did and what I want to share with everybody here today. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the, uh, through the statistics here, but I wanted to lay these out just to put into perspective what we got going on, you know, particularly in Canada to hear right now. You know, we're taking a look at the proportions of Canadians who reported excellent or very good mental health pre and post COVID. So we have some numbers here from 2019, which will be your first category. And then we've got May and July 2020. As you can see, particularly around the teen, adolescent, younger adult uh, populations, we see there's been a substantial decrease in terms of those who would rate themselves as having excellent or good, you know, mental health. Now, it did level off a little bit for older populations. However, the younger ones were noticing this consistent trend. As we move forward and take a look at general anxiety uh, level disorder among respondents here, we're also noticing an increase you know, uh, to a point of having no symptoms. Now we're seeing a lot of mild symptoms and we're also seeing an increase in terms of moderate or severe symptoms, particularly in the gender diverse area. And as I said, when we compound uh, factors that are going on, particularly for those gender diverse, we talk about social justice and we see a lot of oppression going on in the world. You know, this has just been compounded further and especially considering that opportunities for individuals to engage in treatment, attend support groups live are kind of few and far between in most areas, you know, being in these COVID uh, lockdown restrictions, it's very hard to get the assistance that's needed. So it makes sense that these types of numbers will be where they are right here. You know, particularly focusing on the mild symptoms. And a lot of these individuals are going to be ones who would have never previously reported any issues with mental health. You know, here we have the proportion of participants by mental health outcomes, specific populations. Again, now, even when we break it down by different ethnic groups we're seeing here that we are noticing an increase in mental health problems. You know, even going further, we're taking a look 
at um, you know, employment status, what does employment look like? We're seeing unemployment rates are increasing and is in unemployment rates, you know, have kind of ebbed and flowed here uh, throughout the past couple of years, you know, especially in the United States of America where I live, we've seen some major problems, you know, in terms of being able to support people, um, you know, with their work, being able to fund unemployment and so on. Yeah, you know, it's a huge mess, especially considering that we're trying to allocate resources to those people who are actually diagnosed with COVID and are in the hospital, trying to take care of our first responders, trying to take care of our essential workers, the families who are staying home and need childcare and so on. So this is a major problem as well. And as we know, employment is a big part of our identity. It's a big part of task mastery, which we know is important. So if people don't have jobs, you know, they're struggling there in terms of finding their meaning and purpose or having that fulfilled, as well as being unable to make financial means uh, meet at home. So now they're facing perhaps foreclosures, being unable to pay the bills, having their utilities shut off, or perhaps being unable to pay different medical expenses and so on. A lot of people are going without right now. Um, then we also see an increase as well in terms of substance use disorders. You know, it does make sense that we would see an increase in different substances such as cannabis and alcohol, which are more commonly accepted throughout society, uh, seeing a little bit more in terms of tobacco. And we think of tobacco, we also want to think about different nicotine vapes and devices like that. And we've noticed a de general trend in terms of addictions that many people, particularly adolescents or those who are looking to quit smoking cigarettes, uh, cigars, dip, things like that have been resorting to uh, vaping devices, which are considered to be a little bit less uh, harmful to our health. However, we still don't have the long-term studies to necessarily confirm that. But again, we're noticing a general increase with addictive disorders as well. You know, globally, we're seeing some major problems here as well. There's increase in terms of worry and sadness. Um, you know, individuals are reporting increases in physical pain experience. And we talk about physical pain, this may be related to a physiological type of condition, but also it could be a somatoform symptom stemming from a mental health problem. And as we know, people who are dealing with chronic pain, chronic illness, the more stressed they are, weakens the immune system, they stay sick or longer, perhaps have a hard time recovering, and they're going to feel the pain even more. We're seeing mass increases in terms of individuals who are experiencing sadness. And I can certainly tell you that I am one as well. Being somebody who was always naturally happy, you know, it was always my default. If you asked me in any given day, scale of one to 10, how happy are you? I, for me, I would probably tell you a nine typically. Now for me in a given day, it could be, you know, I'm a nine, I'm a three, I'm a six, I'm a two, you know, just kind of all over the place thinking about all these different things. And I know many other people are feeling that as well. You know, many who've uh, lived throughout the past couple of decades are saying that this 2020 has been the most stressful year in their most recent recent history, taking that into consideration, you know, all the people, 190 million saying they've experienced higher stress and so on. So we have a major problem. And one of the things that I want you all to consider here as I speak to this, even if the problem you're experiencing isn't to the point of something severe where you're having, <clears throat> excuse me, symptoms related to an actual diagnosable mental health disorder or an addictive disorder, doesn't mean that you don't need any assistance or you don't need to talk about it, or it's just some problem that's going to go away. You know yourself the best. And if you're noticing any type of change within you, that's the appropriate time to take action. So where do we go from here? You know, this is a big question that a lot of us are asking. And when we take a con into consideration Brappenbrenner's ecological systems theory, you know, there are a lot of directions that we can go in terms of the different symptom or systems. What are we going to do globally? How are we helping one another? You know, donated COVID, COVID va vaccines to third world countries, you know, donating food, other types of supplies and so on are things we could do globally, working together in terms of the research, you know, to be able to come up with better vaccinations, booster shots and so on. On. You know, what are we doing nationally within Canada? What are we doing here in the United States? What are we doing in terms of our provinces or our states? What are we doing more locally in terms of our municipalities? What are we doing at home and what are you doing personally? Now, this is a big struggle too, in terms of there's a lot that's going on, again, outside of our control. You know, and as I say to my clients, as I say to my students, you know, when there are things that are outside of our control, really all we can do in these types of situations is we have to be able to emotionally cope and process through it, work through it on our own, be able to get to that point of acceptance and commitment with moving forward with our lives, you know, but also being able to go through and problem solve some of the more personal things, the stuff that is within our control to be able to get to that better place. 
So in the midst of having a lot outside of our control, there's a lot inside of our control. And that's particularly what I want to focus on here as we move forward. So when life gives you lemons, why don't we make some lemonade? Martin Seligman, uh, he's a former American Psychological Association president. Um, he is also you know, one of the founding fathers of positive psychology. I really love everything that he has to say. And although I don't think positive psychology is going to be the approach that you would use you know, with every single client, every single time, especially those who just went through a major trauma or experiencing uh, moderate to more severe type of depression right away when you're engaging in treatment, you know, Martin Seligman has a lot of great things to say for people who are in a little bit of a better place. And I remember sharing a TED talk uh, with one of my classes and he starts off discussing, you know, how, how it's very rare that he ever has a client who comes in and says, hey, doc, you know what? My life is good. Let's make it great. And I'll tell you my experience, which is nowhere near as much as Dr. Seligman. I have yet to find the client who comes in and says, Matt, hey, you know, how do you take my life, make it good and take it great. So one of the big things that he discusses with positive psychology of that of going from surviving to thriving, which is something that is within our control. And granted, there are different conditions, types of things that we could be in that do significantly limit our ability to do different things. But more often than not, we are in a position to do a lot more than we think we can. And I absolutely love this quote, just as a good life is something beyond the pleasant life, the meaningful life is beyond the good life. If there's a quote to be able to live by, a mantra to be able to live by, this is one that I certainly um, encourage you to put into your little toolkit. Now, when we talk about positive psychology, and I'm not going to get into this at length, you know, we have this uh, conceptualization of PERMA. Uh, this begins with positive emotions. So even though seeking positive emotions alone is not a very effective way to boost your well-being, experiencing positive emotion is still an important factor. You know, so it's very important when we're having positive emotions. The only way to really do that is to be there in the moment to fully embrace the positive as it is coming across. We don't want to dwell on the negatives of the past. We don't want to worry about the future. We want to fully embrace that positive emotion as we have it, when we have that authentic opportunity. You know, engagement, having a sense of engagement in which we may lose track of time and become completely absorbed in something we enjoy and excel at. Uh, more specifically, this is what uh, Martin Seligman refers to as the process of flow. So flow is, you know, that whole saying, time flies by when you're having fun. Well, time flies by when you're engaged in something you love that you truly enjoy doing. You know, for me, that can be time with my children. For me, that's time putting together this presentation that I'm showing all of you right now or doing my written articles and so on. I love to write. I love to present. So when it comes to that, time flies by. And for this presentation, I got to make sure I don't let it fly by too much because I got a lot of slides to get to. Uh, in terms of positive relationships, we're interpersonal creatures. Not enough can be said you know, about the value of interpersonal personal relationships. We weren't meant to exist in isolation. There's a lot of great that comes by, but even if we think about it in a more basic survival type of sense, we need each other to survive. We need the farmers to supply us with the food. We need the first responders to come pick us up when we collapse at our house. We need the emergency personnel. We need all these people working together to be able to get us to this place. And meaningful, loving, fulfilling relationships are really going to be the thing that take us over the top. As we know, Love can be one of the greatest feelings in the world, but losing it can be one of the worst where we feel isolated and lonely. So that's another important one. Meaning, having meaning in life. Now, oftentimes when we think about meaning, we try to think of something big like world change, connection to the universe and so on. And these are all really great things, but meaning can essentially be anything. It's what makes you happy. It's what gives you drive. It's what, you know, you wake up in the morning, you have your cup of coffee or your cup of tea or whatever it is that you have in the, you know, it's like the Cinderella movie where the birds are coming and bringing you your clothes and chirping and singing a song. You know, that's really having the meaning and how you feel when you get into that point. You know, and I always tell my students, clients, I feel that I found my calling in life. And although this work is extremely, extremely stressful, I assure you, you know, also, it's not something that brings me down. I don't get burned out because I love what I'm doing so much. And I really hope that you all feel the same way about it. And if you don't, talk to me some more. I'll help you with that. Um, and then also that sense of accomplishment. And this really goes all the way back to Albert Bandura talking about task mastery. We feel good when we see ourselves succeeding at things, even if it's a little success. 
that's the type of stuff that helps us boost confidence. So when we're not doing anything, we're trapped in our houses, we're feeling depressed, I can't move forward with my career, I can't see my family, you know, I'm just going to sit here and do nothing but binge eat and watch Netflix all day. Well, that's really where we start to lose that sense of self. And all these things tie in together to help us get from that point of surviving to thriving. Viktor Frankl, um, really, really, really great individual here. One of the founding fathers of existential therapy. As we know, he was a Holocaust survivor. You know, I love the quote that we have here. Everything can be taken from, from a person, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, one's one to choose the attitude, any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. And I apologize, I stuttered a little bit there. <laughs> uh, kind of looking at myself in the screen here, which blocked a few of the words, but you get the point, you can see that. And what's really important to consider here, and he talks about in his book, is he's discussing his experience in the concentration camps of the Holocaust, is it ultimately came down to trying to find any little thing to keep him going. And there was a lot of loss, you know, lost his family, sees people getting beaten, getting executed, you know, outside working themselves to the bone and freezing cold conditions, uh, not being fed to the point of starvation. If they laugh with one another, tell stories are getting beaten. And the one thing that he ultimately came to realize is the one thing you can't take away from me when you've taken everything else is my spirit. You cannot take my spirit away from me. And it ultimately came down to being at a point of looking outside of the barracks that they were in, outside of barred windows and seeing one little dandelion out in a dead field where there's all sorts of garbage and other debris and saying, that is beautiful. The sky is beautiful. Holding on to whatever we possibly can. And that, even when we are in the worst of circumstances, again, easier said than done, but even when we are in the worst of circumstances, there is always a way to be able to choose the appropriate attitude going into it. And even if that is accepting something terrible, such as having a terminal illness or losing someone you love, you're really trying to find the best in all these things because this is how we keep going. Um, you know, moving on along, with Albert Adler talking about how we're not determined by our experiences, but are self-determined by the meaning that we give them. You know, I really love talking about wisdom. That's been one of my hot topics here lately. And individuals automatically think that, oh, well, with age comes wisdom. Just because, you know, I'm 85 years old, I'm wiser than somebody who's 24. But that's not the reality. You could be 85 years old and less wise than a 12-year-old. It's what you make out of the experience in life, whether it's something positive, whether it's something negative, that's what we need to do is we need to process the experience, learn from the experience. How can you make yourself better and respond accordingly? The better able that we are at doing that, the better able we are to grow as we continue to move forward. And I can tell you from my experience being, you know, the big happy who's always about a nine out of 10 on the happiness scale. I've learned a lot from positive things in my life, but since facing some of this COVID experience, some of the depression I've had from the loss that's going on around me, you know, I've really started to take a lot out of the negative experience. And that's how I found satisfaction and wellness, you know, and being able to move forward here. So I did speak a little bit to a year of finding your callings. Um, and this book was really interesting. You know, for many years, I've been out there. I actually wrote a few children's books. I have young kids. I have a six-year-old. My daughter turns one on Friday. And then my four-year-old, Malia, was born on my birthday, May 7th. You know, and I, I'm a very ambitious person trying to do a lot of different things. I got excited having the kids. I wanted to publish my first books. I put together these children's books. And I was reaching out to publishers again and again and again, continually getting denied. And then a couple of them are like, oh, for $10,000, we'll make 200 copies of your book. I'm like, I don't think that's how it works. You know, and I was very fortunate to have some other writing opportunities where people started reaching out to me. And this opportunity came and found me at the beginning of uh, this past January. I was reaching an opportunity. They asked me, what are your interests? They looked at my work, told them what I like to do, love to motivate other people, came up with the idea of this book of daily entries. Like, all right, you have eight weeks to write the entire thing, two weeks to be able to review it and boom, it's going to go out. And I will tell you, those are 10 of the most intense weeks of my life trying to get this done on top of teaching three sections at Yorkville, two sections at SNU, having three small children and all of that. But it was one of the best things I've ever done. And to another point, 
really continuing to build upon the things that you've done and allow good opportunities to come to you. You know, with every passing moment, and this is a quote directly in the book, one of the first ones that kicks it off, you know, with every passing moment comes a new opportunity. If you wait for the perfect moment to pursue your dreams, you may find yourself waiting forever because no true perfect moment ever really exists. Instead, you make the moment perfect when you begin your pursuit. So how did you contribute to your dream today? You know, and this is so true with just about anything in life. We can always find excuses to be able to put things off, you know, and the longer that we put things off, guess what? More things are going to start coming up in our life. They are going to give us more excuses not to follow through with what it is that we really want to do. So the perfect opportunity to start is now, even if it's in the process of thinking about it, writing down a plan, speaking to a colleague, friend, loved one, sharing your idea with other people. If you have one, do it. Start sooner than later. I encourage you to do so as soon as today, if not right now, as I'm speaking. Dreams. If you're here right now, you likely pursued a life dream. I want you all to know that being in graduate school is no small accomplishment. I remember being a graduate student myself. One of the instructors shared with the class, you are in a very privileged group of people. And what I mean is less than 1% of the world population has a graduate degree, whether a master's or a PhD. You know, you probably put a lot of thought coming into this. Uh, you probably shared your dream with a lot of people. There are probably points in your life you never thought that you'd have a master's or a PhD or become a licensed clinician. You know, but you somehow got it together to be able to do it. So if you've gone through and gotten to this point and following this dream, guess what? You can follow others. And that's really what we're here to do. So I know for the sake of time, I can't really take pause to give you the opportunity to write all these things down. Uh, perhaps during viewing the recorded session later, you can look at the PDF of the notes, or if you want to write it down now, you can. But I do want you to start off by taking a moment to write down your dream. Whatever it is, regardless of how elaborate it is, seemingly ridiculous, go ahead and write it down because we've got to start right there. We want to dream smart. Now, I'm not going to belabor this, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with SMART goals, but SMART goals are structured goals. They're one that are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. And within that type of framework, we want to have something that gives us a lot of direction. So one of the directions I have here are the SMART goals I created. I want to publish a peer-reviewed article in 2022. It's specific. I'm going to have a peer-reviewed article published in 2022. Okay, great. Measurable, okay, at least one peer-reviewed publication. Attainable, well, I have an advanced degree. I've got a master's and a PhD. I've been published in other peer-reviewed journals before. So I'm thinking they have the competence, I have the credentials to be able to do this. So, okay, this is a practical goal. Relevant. Well, being in the mental health field as a clinician, as a professor, you know, I do want to be able to expand upon the mental health content. That's a big part of what I do. So it's relevant to my profession and personal fulfillment. And it's time bound. I'll begin writing on January 3rd after celebrating the new year, have my data collected by January 31st, my draft completed by March 31st. And on April 1st, I'm going to start sending out the publication and it's going to draft and it's going to give me time to be able to hear back from different publishers, make any revisions and await the final publication. For those of you who haven't had a publication before, it can be a lengthy process. Some are very rapid to the point you feel like you blinked an eye and boom, it's out. Other times it can take up to a year. So you want to go ahead and think through this. And this is the problem with New Year's resolutions and dreams is that we don't put forth the action plan that's necessary to be able to achieve these. I think dreams are great and we want to have dreams. It's why we stress imagination in childhood. It's ever so important and we should be imaginative as adults as well. But if you don't have an actual plan to pursue the dream, well, then you're going to fall short. You know, does a tree falling in the forest make a sound? I don't know if that was the greatest <laughs> metaphor to give right there. But, you know, something to think about. Your dream can only be as good as the action plan that you have around it. That's where SMART goals come in. And then gave you a little template to be able to use for the SMART goal. You could do a simple Google search, Bing, Yahoo, whatever platform that you use. Type in SMART goal uh, template, and there are plenty of free ones available. And do know that the stuff I've included in this presentation are uh, free resources that I've given uh, credit to here as well that you can see on the pages. So go ahead and create your uh, SMART goal. So becoming the total package, you know, this is something that's really important when I'm trying to to get across here in the book. So if you pay close attention to the book, especially those of you who are here in this program, familiar with the different psychological theories, you know, there is a cognitive restructuring process that does move in a progressive type of fashion. You know, again, you have to learn to crawl before you walk. You have to walk before you run. 
same thing with what you've got here. If you do things in sequential order, you could really see yourself getting to a point of not only fulfilling uh, whatever your particular dream is that you drafted into a SMART goal, but ultimately find yourself being a better person to yourself and other people around you and getting closer to that ideal of self-actualization. Uh, I know many of you are familiar with Carl Rogers, something we talk about, Abraham Maslow talks about it. You know, even for those of you who went to different religions, we talk about nirvana attaining, you know, enlightenment and so on. And this is the same type of thing that we're taking a look at here. And the better you are at running on all cylinders, the more likely you are to go ahead and achieve your goal. Um, so what I did here on this slide is I went and I put forth many of the major themes that are contained uh, throughout the book. And in the book, the book is actually broken down by months. So it's January, February, March. And yes, I was a little cheesy and I did go by monthly seasonal holidays, <laughs> things like that. You know, what's going on with the season, major things, but it's a very diverse type of book. Um, it's a very inclusive type of book that caters to just about anybody who would possibly be reading it. At least that was the intention as I was writing it. And again, I know people have different types of abilities and things, so it's going to have to be some adjustment on your end personally. But these are some of the major themes as we're going forward. So we've got about 10 more minutes left, so I want to make sure that I get to each and every one of these. There's about 17 of them here, so I'll start moving forward accordingly. Have a picture of the tortoise and the hare here because consistency and intentionality with following your goal are ever so important. This is a daily thing, an hourly thing, a minute thing, a second thing. We want to keep on top of it. It's not one of those things where, you know, Monday, Wednesday, I'm going to do it and then I'm going to take the rest of the week off or, oh, I'm having a hard week. I'm just going to forget about it. Even if you're minimally putting effort toward your goal each and every day, you're moving in the right direction. This is how we don't lose sight. This is how we get into a maintenance type of routine. And this is how we minimize lapse or relapse, if you will, where we resort back to the old behavior. We must be consistent and intentional with every single thing that we do and what I'm going to be sharing as we continue moving forward. Making your own luck. I love this quote by Serena Williams. Luck has nothing to do with it because I've spent many, many hours, countless hours on the court working for my one moment in time, not knowing when it could come. And then I gave you some uh, little ideas of the way to be able to think about luck here. And I could tell you the first time it really hit me was after I earned my PhD. You know, I was 31 years old. I'd been in school for a long time. I worked 18 hour days with a 10 hour day job, eight hours of school, many, many, many years. I was exhausted, you know, but I felt very accountable. And I had people coming up to me and saying how lucky I was to have gotten a PhD. And I'm like, wow, you know, in saying that you kind of minimized all the work that I just put into this. Do I feel fortunate? Yes, I feel very fortunate that things aligned. I had the support. I was here in the right place and time. You know, and maybe, maybe there was some luck involved. But, you know, when we sit here and we think about luck, we're trying to put it on something otherworldly, something that's a miracle. You know, we put in the effort to make our own luck. And now there's no guarantees in life. The more effort you put in, the greater likelihood you have it actually achieving this. Um, taking a look towards self-awareness, going back to the whole wisdom point, the more aware you are of self, the more aware you are of others in your surroundings. And that's where wisdom is cultivated. That's where it's facilitated. And that's where it continues to grow. But by understanding what makes you tick, understanding your triggers, understanding the way that you feel passionate about different things, guess what? Other people feel kind of similar. We focus a lot on many different differences. And of course, there's multicultural differences, gender differences, I, I, you name it. There's a lot of differences. However, the reason that the field of psychology and counseling works is because of a lot of the similarities that we have. And when we are more similar, you know, when we take a look at these similarities and recognizing what works within us, that's how we can empathize with other people. And the Jahari's window exercise, if you're unfamiliar, is a really great one to do. You start by exploring the things known to self and others. Then you move on to those that are unknown to yourself, your blind spots that other people see. So you're going to ask questions. Then there are the things you hide from others you know and don't share. And then the favorite for everybody is unknown to you and unknown to everybody else. Have fun with that one. Uh, becoming more mindful of your surroundings. You know, this is extremely important. We want to know what is around us. The more in tune we are with our surroundings, the better able we are to be in the moment. Remember earlier when I was talking about the importance of positivity and fully embracing it? We can only fully embrace something if we're 100% present in it. And the more aware we are of the surroundings around us, the better able we're able to do that. So one of the things I suggest, particularly with clients um, who were trying to work on this, is I'll have them take a look around the room for five seconds, close their eyes, and then start telling me, you know, what types of colors were in the rooms, what type of sounds were 
there, the smells, how do you feel with your eyes closed? What's the experience? And start doing this. It's very uh, meditative. It's relaxing, helps keep you grounded and so on. And it could be something that's a really great starting point to continue building your endurance. Facing your bias head on and working through it. Now, again, this isn't ideal. We all have implicit bias. You know, one of the problems when individuals introspect is they scratch the surface of their bias, feel like bad people, start feeling ashamed of themselves, and then just don't continue doing the work. But the reality is that all of us have this, and it's important to regularly check in with it because things change. Guess what? COVID-19 wasn't a thing a couple of years ago. Now we have people who are biased against vaxxers, anti-vaxxers, we're biased against masks, anti masks political division, and so on. Bias is something that can come at any time. So you have to continually check in with it. Don't be afraid of it. The bias in and of itself isn't the bad thing. Rather, it's what you do or you do not do with it. So continually check in with that. Uh, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. And it's true. The self-confidence piece is ever so important. It all begins with believing in yourself. And as an addiction specialist, there's this saying, and we use it in regular psychology as well, but fake it till you make it. If you don't believe you could do something you're not feeling, just keep doing it until things automatically go ahead and click. So if you have this huge dream and goal, believe in yourself to be able to do it, because if you do, you're going to respond accordingly. That's social psychology, self-fulfilling prophecy. Alfred Adler talks about this as well. We see it tied into other theories. So you have to have that mindset that you can do whatever it is that you're moving into. And guess what? With your SMART goal, you pick something relevant and attainable. So you should be able to do it if you're lining everything up accordingly. Um, exploiting strengths and taking on areas of warranting growth. You know, this is really important. Rather than focus so much on your weaknesses, focus on the area's strengths and use those to be able to supplement the weaker areas. I'm six foot four and a half, size 17 shoe, can palm a basketball on my tiptoes, I can touch the rim of a hoop, but I cannot slam dunk. I'm very uncoordinated, I'm terrible. So being a basketball player wouldn't be for me, but I'm motivational. Maybe I could be a coach. Okay, so that could be something I could do. I actually as T-ball or as a coach of my uh, kids T-ball this past year, never did it before. You know, but going ahead and focusing on those strengths instead of the weaknesses. All of us have strengths. All of us have weaknesses. Even the greatest of the great people you see out there and look up to, they have weaknesses too. Not enough can be said about apologizing and forgiving others. You know, and I want to focus on forgiveness. Remember, when we hold on to some type of grudge, it ultimately keeps us sick. It gets pent up. It just damages our immune system. You know, it's something that's ugly. It's something that's toxic that just continues eating at us. And oftentimes we think that forgiving somebody else is doing the other person a favor. Well, forgiveness isn't about becoming best friends again and kumbaya and all that type of stuff. Rather, it's letting go of the grudge that you have and moving on with your life. So when you forgive somebody, you're actually doing yourself an even bigger favor, but also apologizing for wrongdoings. You know, being one who's gracious, who apologizes, you know, it really is testament to character. And that's something that sets a good example. The more, the more that you apologize and forgive others, the more likely they are to do it for you. Focus on your self-care and your own mental health. Structure in self-care like you would any other type of activity that you have going on in your life. You have your class attendance. You have the time you have to be at work, the time you go to bed. Structure in self-care. Again, intentional and consistent with it, even if it's something small. And it could be watching a half hour funny show on Netflix or Hulu or whatever it is, so long as it's something that's not detrimental to your overall well-being. And if you notice something not right with your mental health, again, speak up about it and do something about it before it becomes more problematic. Remove toxic relationships from your life. I love the saying, when you stop chasing the wrong things, you give the right things a chance to catch you. And for so long in my life, I had done that. I had focused on people who were toxic in my life, who were bringing me down, and I just needed to take a distance from it. And it was hard. And always in the very beginning, it could be one of the hardest things that you do. You know, But over time, the daily hassles were removed, and I found myself much less stressed. And while doing that, I was also able to invest time into those who were quality relationships, who helped build me up. And now my inner circle is as powerful as it's ever been. And you can still do this type of thing, even if you are in COVID restrictions, you know, by sending text messages, making phone calls, doing video conferences, and continuing to be engaged. I know I already spoke about this a lot, but maximize every moment at every single time. Any passing second is a new opportunity to start. We're always moving into the future. We don't need to wait till New Year's Day, your birthday, till you graduate. Well, sometimes you graduate and need a degree to do things. You know, but if you already have what you need in terms of credential and experience and so on, why not start now? And again, you can start small. You know, we don't, you know, we didn't build the Coliseum overnight or anything like that. Things take time. So 
uh, with that being said, maximize every opportunity you have. And, you, you know, I know when we ask people, what would you do if you have one more hour in the day, it would be to add additional work in. You don't have to do that, but just be more mindful of your time. Always be kind. You know, that is one of the things, too, that goes a long way. You know, the kinder you are to other people, you know, the harder it is for them to be mean to you. You know, and one thing that I really find fulfilling in my life is, you know, not even so much when students come back to me at the end of the class with statements such as, oh, you're a competent professor. I learned so much. You're like, but, you know, it feels as though you taught compassion, you taught engagement, you taught understanding. I never, you know, really knew what that looked like. And I'll get those emails even months after a class, years after a class. And that's the type of thing that really fills me up. Kind is notice. It is. You might not think it is, but trust me, it is. And if you want to have healthy relationships, be honest with others, be kind to others. And when you're honest, you don't have to continue covering up your lies, worrying about getting caught in the act or anything like that. Physical health. A lot of it, common sense, eat healthy, get enough sleep, do your annual checkups. But I want to focus on the last statement. Although living a healthy life does not preclude you from illness, it can make a substantial difference. You know, so for those individuals who do face a uh, terminal illness, you know, have already being healthy otherwise can help you live a bit longer, not suffer with the symptoms as much. Or if you're an individual, you know, I had working with addiction, people tell me, Grandpa smoked till 85. He lived a long life. But what was the quality of his life in those final 15 years, you know, from 70 to 85, you know, while still smoking? He was around, but he had an oxygen tank, couldn't get up and was coughing constantly. You were all scared about his health. Think about those types of things. It goes a long way. Finding balance. I love the eight dimensions of wellness by Sam Shaw. We talk about emotional, financial, social, spiritual, occupational, physical, intellectual, and environmental. The more balanced that we are with each of these types of things, the more resilient that we can become. It's very unlikely that you're going to have the highest level of balance in each and every one of these and have a sheet here. Go ahead and rate yourself where you're at. But typically when I work with students or even myself, about five of the eight are in a pretty good place. Maybe three could be in a better place. But again, check in with this because it's dynamic. You might have something happen. Maybe you had a family member pass away. Maybe you just lost your job. Maybe you're dealing with illness. These things change, but the stronger we are in more areas, the better balance and the more functional we could be. The assertion ladder, you know, asserting yourself, standing up for what is right is extremely important. When we assert ourselves, that's when we could actually have our voice heard and ensure that, you know, people are actually paying attention to us. And if they're not, we're not getting what we want. We can move into different environments. And this ladder um, mnemonic is a really great one to be able to explore here as well spirituality and religiosity, you know, for those of you who are spiritual or religious, most of us are to a greater or lesser extent, you know, being in tune with that, meditating, praying, reading your books, attending services, having that ultimate connection. Remember that we are part of something that is much bigger, regardless of what that bigger looks like. We are part of something, we are connected. And the more in tune with that, the more we can be in peace. And also leaving your legacy. Remember, leaving a legacy is not about the one big thing that you do. It's about what you do every every single day, intentionally and consistently, the stuff that adds up over the years. You know, it's not about leaving a ton of financial wealth to the family, but it's about character, being a good person. And that's really how you live on and people want to honor you after you pass. So I have some additional ideas around that as well. And considering in the stages of change model where you're at, are you ready to go? Are you thinking about it? You know, hopefully for those of you who are attending this, you're in the contemplation stage. You do want to maximize your goals. You want to find, um, you know, that passion and meaning in your life. So I'm thinking you're in contemplation if you're here. Now, if you put the strategies together that I've been sharing with you, you can move into preparation and quickly get into the action stage. So again, I really thank you all for being here. But throughout the process, beyond and always, mind your mental health. Remember, as counselors, even when you become fully licensed, there's only so much you can do to yourself. Don't over psychoanalyze yourself. Trust me, I've done it. I'm sure other instructors and professionals have done it. Maybe you to a certain extent, but don't go there. This is why we have other professionals. You can work yourself crazy because I tell myself there's Matt Matt and there's Dr. Matt. Dr. Matt knows the theories, approaches, and methods and can work with many clients and students. Matt Matt is a human being with problems just like anybody else. And when the two of these start to conflict with one another, I get confused, I'm upset, and then I feel like I'm not living you know, my life to the best that I can. You know, So really making sure that we get the help that we need. And always remember, we're in this together. There is support out there for you. I'm here for support. Your other instructors are here for support. Please don't do this alone. And even while moving forward with following your passion and purpose, 
do share that with other people, gather their ideas. We work together and the book talks at length, all these different points, and I'm here to be able to discuss them further. And I hope that you have some uh, wonderful questions and answers. So the floor is yours. So thank you, Dr. Glowiak, for such an insightful and motivating presentation. So thank you. Yes, yes. Please type them in and I will read them off for Dr. Glowiak to answer. First question from Sarah is, what do you do when you feel alone and only have negative critical people around you? That could certainly be a challenging uh, situation. When I'm feeling around and only have negative <laughs> critical people around me, which is an experience that I've had at various points uh, throughout my life. You know, when that happens, I find myself expressing to the individuals that, you know what, okay, Thank you for everything that you're trying to do here. I see that you mean well, you're well intended. I appreciate it. You know, however, this just really isn't helping me here at this point in time. So how about we table the conversation, you know, and I'll go ahead and take a step away from it. Um, at that time, as I take a step away to distance from the toxic individuals, I might you know, listen to a song. That's a big part of self-care. I love listening to music, read or write, or I might find myself texting and phone calling other people in my support network who really helped me out. You know, many of those are my colleague friends um, as a student. They were my peers, you know, in, in different classes who had similar experiences to me. So in short, I would distance from the toxic individual while stating my intentions and then divert to um, individuals who are going to be more supportive. Supportive. Very great. Second question from Levon. Can you speak to more as to how your passion, being a counselor educator, drives you even when things feel overwhelming or you have a lot to do? That's a fantastic question. Um, you know, going back earlier to what I said, is I truly feel that I found my calling and my, I mean, I do. And as stressful as this job, it really does get for me. I find so much fulfillment that it more than overbalances any of the stress that I can feel, you know, with it. So for me, on a daily basis, it's reminding myself, Matt, you are doing something greater than yourself. You know, Matt, you are uh, making a difference in people's lives. You know, sometimes I even have to check in. <laughs> Those of you are my students who've ever sent me, you know, nice emails. I have this nice email folder I've told some of you about, not all of you, but I have a nice email folder. And sometimes I even go in and I'll read some of the student compliments and they just really boost my esteem. And I see that I am working towards something, you know, bigger here. And that's what ultimately keeps me going. And I do recognize and it's taken a long time, especially in the beginning, if I had a client fall short of successful outcomes, or if I had a client who became sicker, you know, I really would beat myself up over it. But the reality is that we can only control what we can control. And even if the outcome wasn't what the client or I had wanted or anticipated, if I did my job, I can feel satisfied in knowing I did my job. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not disheartened, I'm not disappointed or anything like that. But I don't personally attack myself for that, because I know that I put forth the best effort possible. And that's the same thing that extends in the classroom, being a father, any other type of role, you know, that I'm fulfilling, just constantly looking to that bigger picture and realizing with the intentional and being intentional and consistent that I'm always working closer. You know, I have that mentality. I think five steps ahead, knowing I'll get knocked back four. So I'm always usually at least one step ahead with what I'm doing. Daria asks, what about the systemic limitations? such as sexism, racism, et cetera. You talk about the possibility of achieving any goal if it's smart, but sometimes there are circumstances out of our control that prevent us from moving forward. No, and that's a, that's a valid point. And that's something I was uh, saying toward the very beginning that there are gonna be different limitations and things like that that we have to deal with. Um, now, this is something I could probably give you a six hour presentation on. I need to really keep this part brief. But when it does come to social justice, you're absolutely right. There are systemic limit limitations. There's a lot of hate and ugly out in the world and it, it's absolutely terrible. And it, again, it makes me sick thinking about it. Um, and we do realize that, you know, it takes more than one person to be able to change the world. And we've seen some great world leaders get the credit, but it was a team of people who really helped them out. I think when it comes to trying to do something with systemic change is to make the goal a bit more practical. Instead of looking at it, I'm going to, I'm going to change the world. Think about it in terms of, you know, I'm going to change, I'm going to work with this family. 
I'm going to work with my school. I'm going to work with my community and then start to build it from there. Do things that are a bit smaller, you know, especially during COVID, it's hard to go out into a community town hall and give a big presentation. It was putting together little webinars that you could do and collaborate with others, uh, going ahead and writing articles or blogs, creating your website, spreading that awareness. So starting off small and considering what is practical for you to be able to do and going from that point. Now, I wish I could say that, yes, you have a dream of world change and ending racism and other forms of oppression. You know, that's great. Let's go ahead and try to work toward it. I'm working toward it as well. You know, but a more practical place is going to start to start is, okay, I'm in this presentation right now with 70 students speaking to all of you. I can hopefully have some influence on this group. And then I hope that you're going to take what you learned from here to other people. They do it and so on. So start within where you, what is practical. And Brittany wants to know, how can we be more positive when feeling overwhelmed and burnt out? You know, one of the things that could be helpful going back to positive psychology and Martin Seligman, and I know we talk a lot about journaling and CBT, which is one of the most popular, um, you know, theoretical modalities and all my students love it. Many of you have probably taken that class before and it is great um, and journal a lot there. But what I love about positive psychology is that we have gratitude journals and it can be something you could do in the very beginning of the day, at the end of the day, throughout the day, writing down the things that you're grateful for. You know, if you're breathing and alive, you're waking up you're in the world despite all the bad stuff guess what you know today's another opportunity you're alive that's something that's positive you have loved ones in your life that's something positive you have a roof over your head that's something positive you're fed something positive even if it is looking at small things that you wouldn't have otherwise considered as being huge successes in your life you know, really take a look at them for what they are because they are because many of the people who've lost loved ones or have passed away in COVID would wish that they were where all of us are right now being able to attend and speak at presentations and so on. So being grateful for those tiny things can help you find the positivity. Any advice on how to stop procrastinating? Well, procrastination, yes. I mean, it could be a difficult type of thing. You know, I watched a TED Talk I shared with my class where the presenter talked about perfectionism is one of the biggest forms of procrastination you know, because we want things to be perfect in an imperfect world. You know, so we wait and wait and wait and wait and wait to do something to make it perfect. But then somebody who did it to about a 97% beats you to the punch, boom, gets it out there. And that individual or organization gets all of the credit for it. You know, so I think it's really about trusting yourself and what you have right now and continuing to build upon it as time goes forward. If you are a huge procrastinator, go ahead and create it. Again, integrate this into your daily schedule. Say, I'm going to spend a half hour a day working on this goal. Even if it's 15 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes, I'm going to read one article online, look, look up one thing. That's going to really be a great place to start. But you, you got to be intentional and consistent with that and start somewhere. And also trying to get rid of those things that are triggers. You know, if streaming programs are a huge trigger for you to procrastinate, you know, cancel your services or put them on pause for a little bit. Toxic individuals are causing you to procrastinate. Distance from these people. Tell them that you have other things to do. Anything that you could do to limit and engage. And David wants to know, have you ever burned out? And what did you do? And how long did it take to heal? I did burn out. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate that. It's a very, that's a, that's a, yeah, big personal experience in my life. So about 13 years ago or so, it was when I was finishing my master's degree and starting my PhD. Um, you know, I was dealing with a lot. My father was recently diagnosed with cancer. I was sleeping three hours a day to work that 10 hour a day job. I couldn't stand, I was unsure if I wanted to get engaged to be married. Uh, one of my uncles attempted suicide. Another one was robbing my grandparents blind. And my grandfather was calling me upset all the time. People weren't listening to me. I felt unfulfilled. I felt like I wasn't doing anything. And you know, it really got to a point where I was exhausted, uh, driving home 1030 at night, I almost drove off the highway at 80 miles an hour. I was falling asleep at my desk during work. And just, I wasn't my happy person. I was angry and it took a while to build up. I would say it was about six, seven, eight month period. And I ultimately got to a point, you know what, if I'm going to be a counselor, I need to be a client and ended up going uh, to counseling and worked with the lady. I was with her for about a year and was really great. And she found me funny. She would actually laugh at me. She's like, man, you know, the answer is you're taking on too much. You need to set boundaries. Don't be your family's counselor. Sleep. You have plenty of time in your career. Remember, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You know, pace yourself. So 
going to the counseling really helped a lot. And I did start setting boundaries that I still have to this day. You know, so one, instead of working every day, Sundays were a day of rest all the time. I wouldn't work past a certain hour. Started to learn to say no. That's an important one. Remember, every single time you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to something else, which is usually personal time, self-care, time with family, and so on. And saying yes is the easy thing. You please the other person, that person's out of your hair. But then you're sitting there and doing the work when you don't have the time, you feel resentful, you have a grudge, you're not interested in what you're doing. It's just, you know, the bottom falls out. So really setting those boundaries, the counseling helped a lot. And, you know, it took a little while to heal. But ever since then, I've been a lot more level. And it took until about COVID and all the things I've been sharing. And there's a lot more even beyond, you know, what I've shared here that was going on to really uh, bring me down. But in having all these things in order, feeling fulfilled with my work, you know, working on this book and practicing what I preach, essentially, because I always talk about these things to people, you know, that's how I was able to keep myself going. But I mean, I would be lying to you right now if I said I was my typical all the way 100% happy self, you know, but these types of things help keep me going and constantly learning. And overall positive. All right. What's the boundary between respecting others' freedom and being socially, socially responsible? There are frictions brought into the workplace with regards to opinions of vax versus non-vax, and the corporate policy is mostly sidelining anti-vaxxers. How can we bring people together instead of creating more friction and anger? That's a difficult one. And, you know, it kind of reminds me of going back a few questions ago. What do we do when we have societal limitations uh, to try to be able to work through and do a drastic change? And I think that this question falls into that category. And I didn't know my head kind of jerked back as I was, you know, absorbing the question because this is a big one. It's a major problem uh, that, that our nation is facing right now. You know, a couple general rules of thumbs that I would of thumb that I would think about, you know, one, fully educate yourself from credible resources, you know, utilize uh, major university, medical university, especially uh, resources, the research that's out there, you know, look into the governmental resources. If you're somebody who doesn't trust the government, then go ahead and still look at the major medically uh, peer reviewed type of articles that are going on. Um, be somebody who's open to listening to what other people have to say. Don't fight ignorance with ignorance. Don't insist, you know, we talk about assertion. Assertion is tactfully having your voice heard from an educated type of position. You're coming from a place of education, a place from purpose and so on and so forth. And that's really the way that you want to go through and uh, present this to other people. Remember, if you're on one side and you're with a group that's opposed um, to you, you know, as you get heated up, they get more heated up and it's hard to be able to have it intelligent conversation around the topic, you know, so ground yourself, educate yourself, um, you know, have the conversation, spread the word to other people. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, you got to look out for your own family, and you got to look out for, you know, yourself, ultimately, you know, here, you know, in the state of Illinois, where I'm at in the United States, uh, for a long time in my community, we had mask mandates, uh, then the vaccinations came out, you know, then they were lax on the mask mandate. I still wore a mask anyway, you know, to set an example and prevent spread of other things. I don't know, you know, how well the thing was working. And then the mask mandate came out, came back again. So that just completely felt natural to me the entire time. So the bottom line, I would really say, do what you feel comfortable doing. Um, if it came down to a situation of your work is telling you you have to be vaccinated, uh, but you don't want to be vaccinated, and you might have to make a difficult decision of leaving that organization and going somewhere else that actually uh, believes in what you believe in, uh, and those types of things. So sometimes there are difficult decisions. And that's the other point of following your calling that I talk about in the book is a lot of this is an uphill battle. A lot of times you're going to face substantial uh, discomfort. I mean, you are stepping outside your comfort zone, which is one of the hardest things to do do. You know, so being comfortable and making very difficult decisions and standing with conviction when you do those, you know, moving forward and continuing to, you know, do what you believe is uh, right, but also not putting down and hurting other people who are on the other side, because there's way too much of that that's going on. It's just making the problem worse right now. All right. It looks like we have time for this one last question. Okay. And it's how do you consistently ascribe positive meaning to situations? when you are a visible minority affected by systemic oppression and often experience microaggressions daily. 
Again, that's a, that's a very difficult, uh, a very difficult topic. And I regret that these types of things are going on in the world, but it really comes down to focusing on the stuff that you do have uh, going on that is uh, positive in your life. You know, if you are, you know, having opportunities to be part of a program like this, if you are remaining connected with your family, if you are, you know, having work, you do have the roof over your head and so on, you know, and I'm, I am one who does do more so of an upward than a downward comparison. In, but when we really think about it, you know, as I was giving examples earlier, there are a lot of people who are in terrible si situations right now. Those who are, you know, in detention or refugee camps, individuals who are in civil war right now, people who are being tortured, prisoners of war and so on. And it really can get bad. You know, so again, holding on to those things that you do have right now and seeing the positive in those, you know, taking a look at some of the societal changes that are going out there. Although, you know, I can speak more specifically to the United States, you know, although there's a much longer way that we really do need to go, you know, everything that happened with George Floyd really lit a fire and we have different legislation, you know, everything that's been going on with the transgender population, we've had changes in legislation. I know that we had a huge thing go on with an abortion law in Texas and people are up in arms with that, you know, but other areas of the country aren't on board with that and they have different types of things going on you know so celebrating those little victories as they continue to come together but also being real and acknowledging the pain and suffering in the world i do want to stress here and maybe this can even be tied into a closing thought that in following your passion and purpose, it's not about being happy 100%. It's not about not acknowledging the pain and suffering in the world. It's not about turning off the negative things going on in you. I face those every single day because you have to. That's how you grow and learn and you have that type of awareness. We need to do that. But in doing that, we can't allow it to become something that's an anchor that weighs us down. We can't say there's just all this bad stuff that's going on in the world. There's nothing I can do right now. And in fact, many significant movements that have occurred throughout society have been, uh, it began in anger. People were frustrated. They were ticked off. There needs to be change in the world, you know, went out and started protesting. And now I talk about that a lot in the book here as well, is how anger can be turned into something positive and a motivating force. And you know what, maybe for some of you who are on this, again, I'm default to more happy person. Maybe you have another uh, emotion that's more so your default, whatever that one is, that's most natural and authentic to you, use that to passion your fire. And if it is something that is of sadness or frustration, you want to see change in the world, begin doing it incrementally. You do it yourself. You set the example to everybody around you. Spread the world to more people. Don't waver in what you have that's going on. Change what you can and celebrate the victories as we move forward. But as much as I wish I could say that, you know, this book would be the answer to changing everything, it won't. Maybe if everybody read it, uh, we can get a I don't know. You know, but it's really about taking the experience and making it your own. So even when you look at these different prompts I had on the slide, or if you do get the book, you know, those are my words. That's my experience. What I went through, a lot of it I can ground in psychological theory, evidence basis for you, and I can back that up. But ultimately, it's about tweaking it to what works for you. And I tried to keep the prompts general just for that very reason. But I really do regret, you know, the experiences that many of you are having and what's going on in the world. It is terrible. You know, but again, we can't let that be something to where we just shut the door, give up all hope and just let it continue. Remember, silence is passive acceptance. So if we don't do anything, we're essentially continuing to feed into the problem. And that's why this type of approach, you know, can really help you feel more satisfied amidst all the hardship in the world. All right. So thanks once again to you, Dr. Gloiak. And I hope you all download the notes, use some of these practical strategies in your own life, and as Dr. Gloiak suggested, share with others. So thank you for joining.